The medieval mind is one that has often surprised us, appalled us, and amused us all at the same time. And no more so than in the intricate faces and crude figures of the various bits of sculpture which adorn the civic and ecclesiastical buildings of the past. As part of my studies into the medieval period, it becomes apparent that there are recurring motifs and usages of natural forms, where a human or animal is placed directly into the structure of the building itself, carrying a load. This video is devoted to understanding some of these forms and how the Gothic imagination ventured into new and dark places with their beasts of burden. Let's begin with the first form, the Caryatid. The Caryatid is a female human sculptural representation where the body of the woman replaces a column or structural feature to hold a wall, joist or ceiling directly. This form is derived from classical origins, specifically from Greek traditions. One of the most famous examples being on the Acropolis Mount at the Caryatid of the Erytheion. Here, six beautiful figures are locked in an eternal watch over the temple. Academic thought about their origin has wondered if the figures are symbolically placed there as some form of punishment, but there is no record of the ancients having that opinion, and we can only guess their true origin. The caryatid form in medieval hands never attains the same height of realism or size, but it is used, if rather sparingly. One of the most prominent medieval uses of the caryatid is in Giovanni Pisano's 14th century sculptural masterpiece, the pulpit in Pisa Cathedral. His father, Nicola Pisano, was a true sculptural master in his own right, and rather confusingly produced a similar looking pulpit in the Pisa Baptistry. Nicola, as part of the late 13th century drive towards classical forms, leans heavily on Roman sarcophagi and classical poses and motifs. However, his son's work retains much more of a gothic approach. In this piece, the figures of nymphs, demigoddesses, and beautiful women are abandoned, and in their wake, the holy women of the church take up the literal mantle. At the centre of the pulpit are three women attached to one column, thought to represent the virtues, or a physical manifestation of the trivium. Particularly beautiful is the maiden at the back, who, although crowned, is feeding two children from her breast, while an eagle lands on her back, whispering into her ear, Again, interpretations vary, with one thought being that the children represent the two parts of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, with the eagle being the Spirit of God. Either way, Pisano manages to create one of the true masterpieces of high Gothic sculpture, which draws from classical realism, but remains Gothic in thought. Telamon The place of the Telamon, the male form of the Caryatid, is much more pronounced in the medieval mind, and can be seen in a huge number of places and forms. The role of the telamon is often different to the caryatid. While a female lively replaces the column, with her body becoming part of the building, the male struggles against it. Classical representations are such that they are often called atlases, the titan famed for holding the sky on his back. Here is a neoclassical example that I like, from the Casa degli Omnioni in Milan. Here we see six telamon in various forms. Some brace their body to hold up the building from collapsing, while others grumpily refuse to help and spend their lives reflecting on the building they're stuck in. Note how the structure bends to the form, that is, the realism of the figure is the most important thing, and the proportions of the balcony that they hold are changed to fit that space. The medievals flip this notion, with their sculpture moulding itself to the space the Telamon is required to embellish. In the lesser-known Romanesque abbey in Beaulieu sur de Doing, there stands a doorway, or portal as it's strictly known, built in the 11th century. At its head, in the area known as the Tympanum, is the standard medieval motif of a depiction of the Last Judgment greeting all those that wish to traverse the portal. In the centre of the portal is a column which holds up the wide judgment relief, known as a trumo, and on it are depictions of three telamon, one on each exposed face. Then to the first, on the front face, we can see how this human form has been stretched to the space, his body and legs thin and long, and the arms which hold up the top proportionally so. The man has in fact been oversized, his head doubling over to support the weight of the frame. On the left side, a young man sits impishly above a faceless figure, looking down at the viewer, and on the right is a much older man. His skeletal hands wrap round the side of the column and can just be seen from the front. He acts as a sort of memento mori, that young age passes into middle age, then old, then death. In Chartres, France, stands one of the most impressive contributions to Western architecture from the French, Chartres Cathedral. On the west side of the cathedral, on the entranceway known as the Royal Portal, stands a series of sculptural figures on the part of the portal known as its jams. At first, it may look like the figures are placed on top of the columns, but a closer look at their feet shows that they are offset into the column itself, and so are Telamon. 
Here we see that the medieval mind is warping reality to fit space again, creating a mawkish, manneristic image of the human body. Even though they are deformed, there is a sense of resolute purpose and nobility, and passing through the portal with the saints and kings of the past flanking your entrance would have been humbling and inspiring to all viewers. The Italian Gothic Telemon is almost always grotesque, in both the severe and humorous ways that Ruskin describes in the nature of Gothic. In the Cathedral de Camona, the base of a small column, on the external face we see a small figure, heavily worn but still clear, seemingly holding up the whole column with his might. The sense of scale has been abandoned for the space, and so the scene has a humorous nature to it, with the man looking ridiculously small against the weight. At the Duomo di Lodi, either side of the entranceway are a pair of Telemon, the first reminiscent of Beaulieu, with his head doubled over the weight of the building. The right figure is truly horrific, his wide, staring eyes and tense expression giving a very unsettling feeling. Both figures are overweight, and the right holds a money pouch around his neck which shows his greed. Clearly they are figures in limbo, trapped holding up the lintel above for their sins. The austere Germano French style is softened by the Northern Italian, which is playful and terrifying in equal measure. This idea of the humorous grotesque can also be found in the Telemon of Moderna Cathedral. On the left, we see a man whose head has been bitten off by a ravenous lion in a moment that is cruel, but also entertaining to the humble peasant attending mass. On the right, I cannot help but be stung by my northern Puritan sensibilities, but here we have some practically childish humour. An inverted telemon whose broad buttocks support one of the roof beams. Clearly the telemon is a widely used motif in the medieval period, but is constantly played with to beautiful and hilarious effect. The Gobbo The medieval did not just take and copy from the classical world, but adapt to create their own forms. One such form is the gobbo, or gobbi, prevalent in Italian sites. Translated, it simply means hunchback. The gobbi is a derivation of the telemon, which is the inevitable conclusion of distorting the classical purity and the subservience of the body to the space that it's in. This is the west porch of the Cathedral of Ferrara in northern Italy. Here, the noble and beautiful has been replaced with this awkward pose, a rotund hunchback who sits cross-legged and holds up the column above him with a single left hand. The gobby's face has captured surprise or a yawn rather than struggle, and that there is an effortlessness to his pose, almost as if he's casually waiting for the moment to pass. His face is rendered well, and the various chisel marks on the beard, face, clothes and belly have an almost spiral hypnotic movement to them. The gobby of Piacenza has a version where the hunchback seems almost serene as he handles his heavy load. The creature below him is an almost humiliatingly sized lion, which tries its best to be fearsome, but ultimately looks like an angry pug dog. Returning to Moderna again, we can see the motif being used internally as well as externally. On the left, supporting the column of a pulpit, stand a pair of hunchbacks bent over with the weight of their load. Looking closely, we can see how ugly and malformed they are. There is a sense of tension in their bodies, which is unlike the previous gobby we've seen. San Pietro in Bologna has something similar, but it's been removed from its context due to a fire which burnt down much of what it originally supported. While the figure is damaged and not that remarkable, the column, which is as twisted and malformed as the gobby that supports it, stands out as an architectural oddity. The gobby tradition continues on to the Renaissance, with more realistic forms being used at various functions, such as this water holder, sculpted by Gabriele Cagliari. Veronese's father, in Verona, about 1495. While highly realistic, the style makes the face and body of the gobby more severe. Slightly losing the humorous side of the grotesque, the gobby becomes more goblin. My favourite depiction sits on the other side of the first gobby we talked about. Here our gobby sits on an opulent seat, which in turn rests on the back of a lying lion. It's the juxtaposition of ugly hunchback with heroic mode which makes this of significant interest. The Animal Protector As we saw with that last gobby, animals also carry their fair share of loads. One major form is the beast which sits either side of a portal, holding up the jams or porch, commonly known as the animal protector. The beast sits eternally, guarding the holy places from whatever evil might want to enter. The portal to the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Bergamo is novel for the Romanesque. Multi-staged with the rider sitting above it, there is a beautiful complexity to it. At the base of the columns which hold up the first tier are a pair of animal protectors. Two proud lions rendered in a red natural stone stand up and look quite fearsome. In closer inspection we can see a cub nestled under its father for protection, while to the side is a man. It's unclear to what he's doing, maybe feeding or being fed to the lion. 
Lions are not the only subject for the animal protector. Coming from the Byzantine traditions, the griffin is occasionally used. At Verona we see this large beast, half bird, half lion, sedately but attentively watching for evil. In its eagle claws is a bull, clearly its breakfast, and its face houses a grimace that looks like he's crying out. The depiction of the feathers is also rather skillful and a unique feature for these kind of statues. The person next to it you can see the scale of these protectors, which will be exceedingly imposing as you walk through the entranceways. This motif does extend out of Italy into nearby regions, such as this portal from the Cathedral of St. Lawrence in Tolgia, Croatia. Here we see a much simplified, smaller version of animal protector. They sit either side of the portal, carrying a male and female on their backs respectively. They are once again shown with some prey in their hands, with what could be a deer on the left and a bird on the right. The protector style kept evolving into the early 14th century, with the guardians of the main portal of Moderna Cathedral. Here we can see a simplification. Rather than the heavily stylized Byzantine style lion, there is a move towards realism. The lion sitting up attentively, rather than the sedate lines of earlier periods. The mane does retain some of the patterned hair work, which is the mark of the medieval style, and the whole lion does look altogether quite noble. The apex of this style can once again be seen in Giovanni Pisano's Pisan pulpit, where a pair of lions sit under columns, each holding an animal in its paws. The style is not only highly realistic, but also has a highly faceted look, which gives it an almost modernist style. Animal Capitals Another area where sculptural beasts are asked to hold the weight of the building is in the column capital. That is, the often ornamented top part of a column. In the classical world, the types of column capital were very restricted, with the famous Doric, Ionic and Corinthian being used for generations. The Byzantine mind, with its intense yearning towards the natural, soon abandoned these restricted forms to include animals within them. This pair, from the Hagios Dimitrios, takes the Roman eagle and places it at regular points around the head to great effect. The type of animals extended out to other favoured symbolic types as well, such as the peacock, which can be seen in this capital, extracted from the Basilica of Bishop Philip, which resides in present-day northern Macedonia. The medieval mind embraced the animal capital with great vigour, and particularly in the north, where the Germans worked hard in producing a huge number of vibrant and innovative designs. We can see this particularly from this capital. Here, lions lie at the top of the space, while a pair of dragons dance below, creating a silhouette of the shape of the capital. These representations are highly stylized. We can see this in the wings of the dragon, where nature has been bent to create a sense of upward movement. Elsewhere in Germany, we can see capitals such as this, where ornamental elements such as the Celtic knotwork are balanced with depictions of birds which have been so stylized they lose all sense of their nature. Some of the most masterful versions of the animal capital can be found in Montreal in Sicily. This Norman palace, which leans on Gothic and Byzantine masters to ornament it, featured hundreds of individually ornamented column capitals. This example shows what could be eagles or peacocks sitting at the corner of the capital. The level of detail is very high, and they sit on top of a wave of folding acanthus, which is quite beautiful. The apex of the animal capital can be found in Montreal in the last parts of the complex. This highly complicated piece features a man holding two birdmen in impressive detail, but it's compounded by the subtle owl which seems to lift the capital from the centre silently and effortlessly. Elsewhere, scrolls and sprigs of acanthus burst out to create a total sense of harmony with this beautiful piece of art. The Beast Pillar Animals have also been used not to just hold the base of a column, but to make up the column itself. This motif resides in Maine in the French schools, and the first example can be seen in Wasac. Once again, we return to the portal, but this time, rather than a telemon, we see three pairs of beasts guarding the entrance to the door, crisscrossed and standing on each other's heads. The effect is simple, but it creates a harmonic pattern, while still being able to add some of the naturalism and changefulness that the Gothic mind delights in. In a similar vein, we turn to the beast pillar of Suliac, which can be found in the Abbey Church of Sons Marie. This pillar has been moved out of the context of the portal to inside the church. Here, the effect is much more chaotic. Rather than the neat symmetry, we see a cacophony of movement, but there is some structure. Four eagles align in the same way to make a loose sense of connection, but the space in between them is highly changeful. At the top of the pillar, we see another humorous moment, where a man who is bending over is about to be eaten by the ravenous creature. The Germanic mind is equally devious in its depictions of the devoured, as we can see from the beast pillar of Freising Domkirk, Placed in the crypts, the surroundings are dark and depressing, but around this column we see a number of fantastical beasts waging war against humanity and winning. 
The best moment is on the face which depicts a reptilian monster rising from below, consuming a whole man. Zuliak also houses a minor church with, with a much more simple rendition of the beast pillar. Here, rather than the huge number of beasts darting around, we see two beasts at the top, spewing the rest of the column from their mouth, and an alternative stripe of leaf motif and animal. The Germans brought this concept to the northern Italians, where it was further refined and beautified in the columns of Luca Cathedral. Here, it's hard to see, but every column has a unique motif or symbology on it. For some, opus sectile matches stone with stone, but for others, beasts are used to beautify. Here on the left, we can see a mermaid splitting his fins, while a pair of lions consume an unlucky deer above him. On the right, a swarm of dragons float around the pillar in a mirrored form. In some examples in Luca, both the capital and the column themselves are totally covered with beasts, both in structural relief, but also in inserted stone, like at the top of the column of this example. The Beast Tomb Beasts have long been used to adorn the tombs of the great and the good, both as guardians, as friends, and as symbols of the vanquished. The Spanish Goth particularly loves the use of the beast on their tombs, and our first example is the tomb of Ferdinand Perez de Andrade, buried in Bethanos. Here, this exquisitely crafted tomb is made even more impressive by the dual beast it sits on. On the left is a boar, and on the right, a bear, showing the martial prowess of their master, but also as acting as spirits of protection. The UNESCO listed tomb of King Pedro in the Alcobaca Monastery in Portugal follows a similar motif, where the tomb is placed on a series of beasts three on each side. The tomb itself is a gothic masterwork, with stone being rendered so delicately that it looks like the ornament is floating in the air. The beasts are well rendered, but small. Whether this is the humour of the grotesque, or an attempt to show the scale of the tomb, they add a sense of otherworldliness to the composition, almost as if Pedro had command over the beasts themselves. The Met houses a series of similar tombs, this one in particular being that of Ermengol X, Count of Urgil. It is thought to be an 18th century copy of the original, and we can see the Iberian motif of the beast under the tomb once again. This time the lions have been twisted beyond all recognition, producing a far more horrific monster than in other depictions. Turning to England, the infamous King John rests in Worcester Cathedral. John rests his feet on a lion, and this can be interpreted in a number of ways. The lion is an animal spirit protecting him, or he is holding the lion down with his feet, subduing it. Something tells me his connection with his brother, Richard the Lionheart, makes it more likely the latter. There have been many animals used as footrests, which are much more friendly, such as the tomb of Sir Richard Pembridge. Here we see a small, loyal dog awaiting his master's reawakening. This theme is particularly common in English tombs. And finally we have the tomb of Henry Burgesh, which resides in Lincoln Cathedral. At the bottom of his feet sits a writhing dragon, chained and defeated, but angry in its position. No doubt this represents some great evil, demon or sin, conquered by the bishop. The Green Man The mysterious iconography of the Green Man has perplexed many, and is a symbol that has occurred and reoccurred for centuries. Some of the earliest depictions of the Green Man can be seen in Byzantine works, such as this mosaic from the Imperial Palace in Constantinople. During the middle period of the Byzantines, the Green Man moved from the floor to the column in this 6th century capital currently residing in the Istanbul Archaeology Museum. The first major motif of the Green Man shows a face with leaves emanating from its centre, indicating that it is some kind of natural or wood spirit in origin. The medieval takes the Green Man as a key motif, and is especially used in sculptural structural works. Here we see a brilliant rendition of it being used as a structural support. The leaves which once emanated from the face of the Green Man have been used to create contours and features. The gaps between the leaves its eyes, and the folds of the leaves its furrowed brow. The second motif is where greenery is emanating from the mouth of the creature in a rather violent way. Here in Oakham Church there are a series of Green Man capitals, which at first look like capitals ornamented purely in leaves. But when we follow where those leaves emanate from, we see this rather horrible face at its centre. The Lady Chapel in Ely has an even more grotesque version, where two great branches of oak leaves are wrenching themselves out of the monster of the beast. And finally we come to this green man which resides in the boss at the apex of one of the majestic gothic vaults which make up the ceiling of Exeter Cathedral. Here the humble green man is replaced with a screaming beast whose features are exaggerated, wide nose and thick lipped. The foliage itself wraps round the man to support the whole structure and creates the circular boss shape which is mirrored at other points along the ceiling. Conclusion the medieval loves to use both animals and humans as a point of interest and symbolic focus. Adapting forms and reality itself to the space, we see totally original creation which inspires us, 
even today. The Gothic Beast of Burden lived on in a number of forms after the medieval age. In the Northern Renaissance, buildings like Hedeberg Castle, which, although ostensibly classical, still retains much of its Gothic vitality. In the 19th century, the Renaissance revivalists take key medieval forms, such as the mermaid, and update them. And with the fin de siècle, Art Nouveau creates green men and women more beautiful than ever before. <laughs>